Okay, on this section we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm actually going to use the text, uh, the electronic text book, because I think it's going to make uh, some of the examples that need to be covered in this section a little bit more clear. And um, they weren't on the PowerPoint slides, unfortunately, so I thought this would be a much better route to go. At any rate, uh, we're going to be doing Chapter 2, Section 3, Atomic Structure and Symbolism. And uh, we're going to write and interpret symbols that depict atomic number, mass number, charge of an atom or ion. Of course, that's all going to be review for you. We'll define the atomic mass unit. We'll talk about average atomic mass. And we'll calculate average atomic mass and isotopic abundance. Now, all of these things should be relatively simple to you, um, uh, hopefully familiar too from physical science. So anyway, let's go ahead and move through this. Now if we talk about a nucleus, and we were to say um, the dimensions of the electron cloud of a nucleus is roughly 10 to the negative 10th meters, uh, you can see that the, uh, excuse me, of the, of the atom of the electron cloud, 10 to the negative 10th meters, you can see that the nucleus is actually very small in comparison. It would be 10 to the negative 15th meters, or 100,000 times smaller. It says that right here in the text. And um, that's roughly the equivalent of taking a blueberry to represent your nucleus here. If you were to take a blueberry and put it in to the middle of the football field and if you could wrap the roof onto the football stadium and make a 3D sphere out of this thing that's roughly the size of the nucleus to the football stadium. So that should give you a pretty good idea of what we're talking about in terms of scale and size. The, the nucleus as you can see is a very small part of the atom and it's really filled with a, a whole bunch of empty space. Now, the uh, fundamental unit we use when we talk about properties of uh, items such as atoms are called the atomic mass unit right here in bold. Um, also can be represented with the fundamental unit of charge, which is E. Uh, the and you can read here a little bit of the history of it. One AMU is one twelfth the mass of a carbon twelve atom, and carbon twelve is going to be the version of carbon that's got six protons, six neutrons. And if you take calculate one twelfth the mass of that, we establish that as an AMU. It's also sometimes called Dalton or a uh, unified atomic mass unit U. Um, they're all equivalent to the AMU, and you can see here an AMU is actually calculated at 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. Now, um, let's take a look at some of the parts of the atom, right? We know there's electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, the electrons, where are they located? Well, outside the nucleus, um, they're located in the electron cloud. And we've got their charge here calculated. You can see it's a negative for the electron, whereas the protons got exactly the same charge, but positive. So you've got a negative one and a positive one unit in net charge for the electron and the proton. But you can see the mass of the electron is significantly smaller than the mass of the proton. Um, to the tune of, let's see, tenths, hundreds, thousandths, ten thousandths, um, and, and some some change. So it's, it's uh, and again, 9 divided by 16, so it's about half of that. So you're looking at roughly um, about one two thousandth the size of a... Um, of a proton, that is the electron. So an electron is roughly one two thousandth the size of a proton. I think it might actually tell you that here somewhere uh, in the readings, and, and you could probably kind of skim through it. Yeah, 1,800 electrons to equal the mass of one proton. Yeah, so so pretty close there. Um, and, and you can also see that the proton and the neutron, of course, the neutron's got zero charge, but it's pretty close in size to that of a proton. Slightly larger, but pretty close in size. So um, when we take a look at this, when we start looking at the mechanics of how we identify some of these atoms, we, we have some numbers. Now, the atomic number, you may remember, is the number of protons, and mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, so it's the addition of both. So what? let's say you have the mass number, the atomic number, because those are generally the two things that are given to you when you look at the periodic table. You'll have the mass number above the atomic number, and so if you were to subtract the atomic number, from the mass number, you would get the number of neutrons. That will give you the number of neutrons in that particular isotope. Um, an ion, when the numbers of the subatomic particles are not equal, in other words, um, 
the positive and negative charges are not equal and they don't balance out to zero, we call it an ion. Um, and so you may get positive ions and negative ions and we call positive ions cations, C-A-T-I-O-N-S. Okay? And that's usually the result of taking a neutral atom and removing an electron or two or three from it, which makes the charge more positive. Whereas an anion is a negatively charged item that is gaining electrons. So it's got more electrons than the standard neutrally charged um, periodic table version of an element. And I always remember the anions negative by saying A negative ion. A N I, A negative ion. Uh, whereas cations, I just remember that's the opposite of the anion. And that helps me keep them straight. Um, you can read here about goiter and, and uh, thyroids and why we put iodine, iodine on our salts and stuff, and it's pretty much eradicated that in the U.S. Um, goiter, um, which is common throughout the world. It says like as much as 40% of the world's population is still at risk of iodine deficiency, but uh, because we consume a lot of salt here in the U.S. and we iodize our salt in a lot of cases, um, I think even the fast food restaurants, those little packets of salt, if you get, if you read them, they, they say that they're iodized salt. Um, we pretty much make up for our iron iodine deficiency by um, through our salt intake, and in, here at least in the U.S. Now, let's say you had a um, iodine, and you wanted to figure out how many neutrons and such that you had. So, for instance, you've got um, iodine. It's got an atomic number of 53, meaning it's got 53 protons. Um, and you're told that the mass number is 127. So how would you figure out the number of neutrons it has? So 53 is the number of protons, and 127 is the number of protons and the neutrons. Then if you subtract the 53 from the 127, you get 74. And 74 would actually be the value for the number of neutrons you have. It's quite a simple problem to do. Um, and then if you want to calculate the charge on it, of course, since the iodine is added to a negative 1 anion, to calculate the number of electrons, you would take the neutral atom, which would have 53 protons and 53 electrons, but because it's got an overall charge of negative 1, they refer to that up here, negative 1 charge, mass number 127, so that if you take 53 minus negative 1, you actually get 54. So it would have uh, 53 protons, 74 neutrons, and because it's got a negative one charge, it has one extra electron, so it would have 54 electrons. And then you can go ahead and try that out with your uh, other um, practice problem here with platinum and, and see how you do. Now, chemical symbols. You may remember these. Uh, chemical symbols represent two things, um, lots or little. You can have it represent a single atom of a particular element, or it may represent a whole lot of that particular element. Of course, here you've got uh, mercury, HG. Um, this is obviously one more than one atom of mercury. It's a whole lot of atoms of mercury. Um, but the point here is when we label these things, you remember that we always capitalize the first letter and then the uh, second letter of the, symbol, of the symbol for the element is always lowercase. Um, for instance, they give you the example here. If you had C, capital C, little o, that would represent the element cobalt. Whereas if you had capital C, capital O, that would represent the elements carbon and oxygen. You would have, of course, one oxygen. So it would be carbon monoxide. So um, again, you have to be careful of that. Remember, always capitalize the first letter. Keep your second letter lowercase. Some elements just have a single capital letter. That's fine. Um, and then some elements are, are named from their Latin version. So so you may think, see things like gold, which comes from aurum, um, from the Latin. And so gold symbol is a, capital A, little u, not uh, capital G, little o, as you might think. Sodium from natrium, sodium's capital N, little a, not capital O, uh, capital S, little o. So, so be careful of that. There's some exceptions there, and you'll get comfortable, and you'll learn how to use the, the periodic table for that. Uh, you can read here about the, um, the elements past 92 and how they've named them um, based on the Latin for the number over time. But let's get into the last two sections here real quick. Isotopes. Now, isotopes are variations of an element, right? Um, the number of protons determine the identity of the element. So if you change the number of protons of an element, you are changing the element. So you don't want to do that, uh, at least um, unless you're trying, like the alchemist, to make gold. 
which would probably be financially beneficial. But for most cases, you're, you're really not trying intentionally to change the, the, the element by changing the number of protons, which is extremely difficult to do. and We, we certainly can't do that in the laboratory, so um, at least in ours. But um, what you'd like to do here is take a look at different variations of the same element. So they all have the same number of protons, but they have differing numbers of, of neutrons. And so, for instance, you might have 24 mg. And we would say that's uh, magnesium 24. Uh, so magnesium, and then you say the mass number 24. You could also write it as magnesium hyphen 24 or mg, which is the symbol dash 24 uh, or hyphen 24. And so 25 mg is read as magnesium 25 or magnesium dash 25 or mg dash 25. Um, but the bottom line is magnesium still has 12 protons in both cases here, whether it's magnesium 24 or 25, it still has 12 protons. But in the case of magnesium 24, it's going to have 12 neutrons as well, right? Because the mass number is the combination of the protons and neutrons. Whereas magnesium 25 is going to be the combination of the protons and neutrons. So again, if it's magnesium, it's going to have always 12 protons. So the difference, 25 minus 12, is 13 neutrons. And so magnesium 25 is 13 neutrons. And usually when you see it on the periodic table, you'll see the mass number in the upper left corner followed uh, down below in the lower left corner by the atomic number, and then the charge, uh, positive or negative charge of the ion, if you're looking at an ion in the upper right uh, corner. Now, when you see these on the periodic table, um, anything on the periodic table that you're looking at is understood to be have a uh, have a zero stable charge. Uh, it's got a same number of electrons as as protons. But we can easily look at their oxidation states and, and see how they'd react with other other elements by where they're located on the periodic table, and um, easily be able to extract their their. Um, um, ionic charges if we need to, to to do some calculations which we will now here we're going to take a look at some some variations of elements because because one of the things that Dalton said was that um, um, all elements or all atoms of the same element were you know essentially the same in other words oxygens oxygens oxygen there's no variations of oxygen or hydrogens always hydrogen which is always hydrogen but we find that that's not true because there's variations of these. If you look right here at the very first element, you've got hydrogen that can have a mass number of one and a uh, atomic number of one, which means it's got one proton. So if it's got one proton and its mass number is one, which is representing the number of protons and neutrons, it's literally got no neutrons. So you've got atomic number one, one proton, no neutron. Uh, they've calculated the atomic mass here for you and how often we find this. So this is actually 99.989% uh, of the time. This is what we see a lot. Hydrogen is proteum um, when we're dealing with it. Now there's also a heavier version of hydrogen. Uh, again, still one proton because it's hydrogen, but it's got a mass number of two. So it's got one proton and one neutron. It is represented here. It's got a mass of 2.014. And it shows you that in nature, really, it occurs only 0.0115% of the time, so very small. And there's a third version of hydrogen, tritium. Um, so you can see tri for three, do for two, and, and pro for one there. But uh, for, for tritium here, you get a mass number three, which means it's got one proton, as indicated here by the atomic number, uh, but also two neutrons. And it's got a mass of 3.01605, and it indicates here natural abundance is trace. It means it's uh, so negligible, it's really in very, 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 very rare. So you can see almost all the hydrogen that we experience is uh, of the protium version. Um, and if you add these two together, you get pretty close to one. And then this trace amount here, the tritium, is really what makes up the third third amount. So really when we take a look here, um, what this table is telling us, for instance, let's take a look at lithium here. If I take a look at lithium, the atomic number is three, so it's got three protons. That's what identifies it as lithium. But we've got really two versions of lithium that you're going to find in nature. You've got one with a mass number of six and one with a mass number of seven. In other words, this one's got three protons and three neutrons, and this one's got three protons and four neutrons. Uh, both have slightly different masses because, you know, the net mass of a proton and the mass of a, of a neutron are slightly different. Uh, in addition to that, this 
um, version with mass number 7, lithium 7, actually has an extra neutron. So that's accounting for the difference in the masses. But if we look, because we only find these two variations of lithium that exist in nature, if we add the 7.59 up and the 92.41, you actually account for 100% of all the lithium that's found. And that's what natural abundance means. This is the roughly the percentage of the amount of time you'll actually find it in nature. For instance, lithium-6, I will find 7.59% of the time naturally occurring in nature, um, and 92.41% of the time it will be lithium-7. And to calculate what the actual mass you see in the periodic table is, you would take the mass of the version that you're looking at, times the natural abundance, and then you would take the mass of the other isotope times its natural abundance, you'd add it together, and um, voila, you'd be able to calculate your um, um, atomic weight for that element, and it'll actually match up extremely nicely with what you have before you on the periodic table. Now you can see some elements here like carbon and such, they actually have three variations. You've got carbon 12, which is what's used to determine the atomic mass unit, the AMU. Um, you have carbon-13 and carbon-14. Carbon-14 is um, something that we use for uh, radiocarbon dating, right, for identifying fossils and such. And so this has uh, eight neutrons and seven neutrons and six neutrons, slightly different masses. Now, uh, carbon-12, 98.89% of the time in nature will find carbon-12. So we would multiply that times its atomic mass of 12. Uh, we would multiply carbon-13 uh, times uh, its relative abundance of 1.11 times its mass of 13.0034. And then carbon-14, it's uh, so non-existent uh, because it's a radioactive isotope. Um, we, we very rarely find it, and in, in usually it's in trace amounts. Um, and so it's got a slightly heavier mass as well, 14.0032, because of the additional neutron. So we could take we could multiply these all out and calculate it. And you can see this here really accounts for about 100% of all the carbon that you'll find. This is so extremely rare um, that calculating it's negligible. Okay, so um, please watch this build an atom simulator. If you're unfamiliar with protons and neutrons and electrons, this is actually a fun little toy to play around with. You just click on the link here and it'll open up the simulator and you can start adding protons and neutrons and electrons and start seeing what it does to the stability of the atom. You can see what it does to the charge. You can see what it does to the mass numbers, uh, the atomic numbers, and um, it's uh, pretty fun to play with. Now, atomic mass is kind of what we were describing up above. To calculate the atomic mass of an element, it's going to be the sum of the isotopes, uh, which is equal to, well, which is actually calculated by the fractional abundance, which is the percent relative abundance from the table above, times its isotopic mass. And so, for instance, to find the average mass of boron, we would see these two values here, uh, like it says here, um, about 19.9% of the time. So to take this out of, in, of uh, fractional, or excuse me, out of percent format, you divide it by 100, which means you're going to move your decimal two spots to the left, so you get 0.199, which gives you this value here, of all boron. Uh, which is boron 10, has a mass of 10.0129. So you put that in here. So 19.9% of the time you find boron 10 that's got this mass. So again, you put it, take it back out of um, percent format, put it into a regular numerical format, and then you're going to multiply those two. Then the other isotope for boron 11 is 80.1% um, of the time, so 0 0.801, times the um, mass of 11.0093, multiply those. So when you multiply these two values, you get 8.82, you multiply these two, you get 1.99, you add these two together and you get 10.81, and if you look at boron on the uh, periodic table, you'll see that its mass is actually calculated at 10.81. It's a weighted average mass. It's not merely what you get from the most common um, common isotope, although the most common isotope actually drives it. And where do we get these values from? If you were to look back up here, boron, you can see these numbers right here. 
okay, the 11.0093 times the 0 0.801 and the 0 0.199 times the 10.0129. Like I said, you multiply them across, add it together, and that'll give you the weighted average. And when you look a bit more on the atomic, uh, excuse me, on the periodic table, you'll see that it's actually got a atomic mass weight of 10.81. And that's how you calculate it. Now, what if you know the, um, ba, 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 what are we looking at here? What if you know the percentage of the gas um, and you know, um, but you don't know the average mass. So you're trying to figure this out. You're trying to work it backwards. Um, in this case, this is a relatively simple problem to do. You would just take the, um, this is actually a straightforward problem. So yeah, this is real easy. So you would just take 19.92 times the 0.9184 plus, so there's three versions of neon. You got 20 neon 20, neon 21, neon 22. So it's really the sum of the relative abundance times the mass of each of the isotopes. So in this case here, the mass of neon 20 is 19.9924 times its relative abundance, which is 0.9184, which is right here plus the mass of neon 21, 20.9940 20 times 0.47. In this case, you're gonna move it two more spots, so it's gonna be 0 0.0047. And then uh, you're going to add it to the mass of neon 22, which is 21.9914 times 0 0.00, or excuse me, two decimal spots, so 0 0.0769, which you have right here. So you multiply them out, you get these values, and this gives you 0 0.00. 0 0.099 and then this gives you 1.69 you add it up you get 20.15 so the average mass of neon in this particular problem I guess which is relating it to I guess traveling through space and hitting the solar wind and stuff is 20.15 AMU which is less than what you get on Earth, 20.1796. 20 um, but there's probably some degradation to the neon as it's been traveling through space and as it um, hits the solar wind and dust debris in the um, in, in the uh, the universe as it's traveling, and then ultimately burns up a little bit when it comes into our atmosphere. So the the calculation of the average mass of the the various versions of neon coming in from galactic space might actually be slightly different than what we calculate here on Earth, and that's what you can see in this case on earth the average is 20.1796 amus and this sample here from a meteorite is 20.15 amus uh, you can calculate some other values here yeah so this is the problem i think i was thinking of so what if you actually get something where you know the average mass but you don't know what the fractions are you don't know what the percentages are so you can actually calculate this right so if they give you the average mass 35.453 in the problem you can write that in now you know the mass of 35 chlorine uh, or chlorine 35 you can just look that up and you know the mass of chlorine 37 you can look that up and now to to get the fractions though if, if one of them is remember they had to total one right because they're, they're both percentages but if you take them out of percent format they're going to total 1.00 so if you take a look at this fraction here this first fraction you have x and then for the second fraction, it's going to be whatever the difference is of x. So 1 minus x. So the total value minus whatever you got here. So this is 1 minus x is actually representing the balance of whatever x is. So when you multiply this out, of course, you get 34.96885x plus um, 36.96590 uh, time or excuse me minus 36.96590x as you multiply this times this you use your distributive property now you um, you do your math you bring stuff over and, and in fact if you move this 36.9 over here to this side it's going to be negative and you move this over here it's going to be negative so both sides will be negative so you can actually just flip the signs and make them both positive again so you get x is equal to 1.513 divided by the difference between these two subtracted, so this minus this, 1.99705, and it's going to give you the value of 0.7576, which is equal to x right here. And then this value here is going to be this subtracted from 1. So 1 minus 0.7576 is 0.2424, which is going to be the value of the of the second version of chlorine. So you have 75.76% 
um, is the relative abundance of chlorine 35 and the relative abundance of chlorine 37 is 24.24. So, so basically it's like working the same problem from a different angle. It's kind of like doing density, but instead of giving ma being given mass and volume, you're being given uh, volume and density and being asked to calculate mass. It's just a variation of the problem. Last thing we take a look at here is the mass spectroscope. These are really cool. And in fact, in biology and chemistry, these are probably one of the most heavily utilized pieces of equipment because you can just do so much with it. And essentially the idea is here, if I take a sample of something, I can put it in this piece of equipment, which is going to heat it up here with this coil, and it's going to get bombarded with an electron beam source, which is going to rip some electrons off of it creating it uh, as a positive cation or cation which is going to get accelerated through these plates um, and then based upon how how many electrons have been pulled off what its mass to charge ratio is it's going to separate out into different sets of a beam and then it's going to detect that and you're going to calculate the relative abundance on this side which is going back up here oops you know, you're gonna be you're gonna be identifying the the relative abundance in the samples here, something like that. That's natural abundance, but we're gonna pretend that's kind of similar here for the concept of doing um, this particular problem. So it's gonna give you on the um, y-axis relative abundance, the percent of it. So in this case here, 90 percent, or, or or actually, excuse me, I'm sorry, for this is the mass to charge ratio. So the mass to charge ratio here for zirconium 90 is going to be roughly 90. And you can see zirconium 91 is going to be roughly 91. Zirconium 92 is going to be roughly 90. See how it makes sense? So it's giving you the mass to charge ratio on your x-axis, which makes it nice and easy to identify. And then on your y-axis, your vertical axis, you can see the relative abundance. So we've got 50, and we'd have to say here these are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, increments of 10. So between 50 and 60 here, probably say 51 or 52. So we have uh, zirconium 90, it's roughly 51 or 52 percent. Uh, for zirconium 91, it's roughly 11 percent. Zirconium 92, probably... 17% zirconium 94 roughly 17% zirconium 96 roughly 4% 3% and these numbers should all add up to 100% when you put them all together but basically this specific sample here is going to be able to allow me to identify exactly what 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 the sample was it'll help me identify what this sample was a sample of based on its max spectrum and so it's a very cool tool. You can watch the animation here on OpenStax College. Um, click on that, watch that. That'll be helpful for you to actually kind of show you in more detail um, with some animation and such how it actually works. And they talk about some of the other things as well with Dalton that are well worth taking a look at. So, so put some time into this section, work on these problems. Um, these are important. You're going to see a lot of these on the test because this is important to be able to know. And once you're able to do this stuff, it's really, really simple. And it's going to make a lot of sense. So when you're looking at the periodic table now, things are going to start falling into place on why stuff is where it's at and also where these values and numbers come from, how they're actually calculated. Okay, so I hope this tutorial helps you. And uh, again, this was chapter two, section three. And we can do some more of these problems in class. And we'll, we're going to go over some of those problems from the end of the chapter as well. So, so uh, move on to those, get them done, and uh, we'll talk about it more. Thanks.